these are the people, perhaps at least one, maybe two, maybe three, I don't know, will actually get to be a senator representing Queensland. And that is a very responsible position. You have to make decisions that are not just about people's livelihoods, very often it's about their lives. It is a, a very serious position to take on. And so we want to be comfortable that the people who are going to put their hand up realise that and are committed to doing the right thing by everybody in the constituency, not just people who happen to vote for them. I know they all say that, but we all know it's different, don't we? But I'm sure this lot here are quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. They will look after everybody in the uh, electorate. Now, I have invited other people to come here along here tonight. And by the way, um, you would have seen in the correspondence that you get from me that I it really resonated with me what Mel Melanie Phillips said about the, the discourse these days is not between left and right. It's between people who accept truth, reason and reality and those who do not. So we are dedicated to truth, reason and reality. Okay? Now, that point is made specifically because I will tell you the truth about the people who haven't turned up tonight. Um, first of all, Dr Cameron Murray from Sustainable Australia, when I rang him, he first of all, he said, oh, that might be school holidays, I think I'll be camping with my son. And I said, well, that's in an election period. And he said, oh, I might be out camping. I thought, okay, fine. And then I look at Facebook today and he's on the Darnley convoy with Dr. Bob Brown. Sorry, he's camping. <laughs> so he's possibly going camping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, Senator Larissa Waters has opened my email 23 times and has not replied at all and certainly hasn't turned up tonight. So I think they're pretty aware that this is on tonight after having read the email 23 times, unless there's some reading comprehension problem there. I think they would know and um, they have not turned up tonight. The ALP, I had sent out four emails and I uh, extended a deadline for information that I needed twice. I got something from a staff member the day after the second deadline saying, we note your single email and we will take advice. That's the last I've heard from them. And they are not here this evening. The reason I'm saying this is if they want our respect, they've got to respect us. They can at least RSVP, all right? Um, Tudor's Fishers Farmers, I, I spoke to the secretary, he said he would talk to the president who would get back to me and they have not done so. So I don't know what's happening there. Clive Palmer's party, I rang their office three times, three times I got a recorded message, send us an email. And I thought, all right, I'm not bothering with you again, third strike, you're out. If you can't, with all of your buildings, employ a receptionist, you know, how can you run a country? So anyway, after he announced that he would be the Senate candidate, I thought, right, I'll give you another go. And I tried again and I got the same thing, a recorded message. I say this because as a voter, I find that kind of lack of communication and unwillingness to interact with the electorate pretty unsavoury. And so I'm just sharing that with you because that's what I do. And if it's uncomfortable for people to bite me, I don't care. That's the wonderful thing about being on, you just don't give it in. Yeah. <laughs> over 60. Over 60, yeah. Well, over 60. <laughs> okay, so that's us. We are here about truth, reason, and reality. We are here about democracy. We are here about learning about people who are going to be on that Senate form. There's probably going to be dozens of them that usually are. And we are also here to give a message that we consistently give. Look at the calibre of the character of your candidate. Don't just vote trouble. Do not vote trouble. That is just a technical move. It's a sheeple move. Don't let other people make a decision for you. That's why you see them here. And you can say, well, I like that person. I like what they have to say. They will go on my list. Now, that would mean it follows that it's a really good idea to vote below the line. 
instead of above the line, which is the territory of the parties. And the small players in the game just don't get a look in. So we encourage people to vote below the line. We, we don't say just take a party ticket. There may be someone in a ticket who you just personally think is just not the right person. So why would you vote the party ticket to give them a leg up by default? And uh, so we just say, okay, vote for the people who you think are going to do a good job. Be very discerning, do your homework, and vote for people who are going to look after this country. Because we're sick and tired of getting ignored. Yeah. Okay? So, thank you so much for coming this evening. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Kevin James, who is a Toastmaster extraordinaire, who will conduct the, the uh, uh, speeches with all of the Senate candidates. And uh, he tells me, now don't take offence, Kevin, because I'm going to say a nasty word. He tells me he's a tiny Nazi. Right? So, let's see what you've got. Okay. Thank you. Kevin James. Thank you so much, Jewel, and thank you everyone for turning out tonight, especially our nine candidates here, our nine speakers tonight. We're all about truth, reason, reality, and democracy. Now, the rules of the game tonight, each speaker will get five minutes. The order has been drawn at random. As the timekeeper, I will sit in the front row, and each of the speakers or their representative has been told that four minutes, I will raise my finger. You have one minute. You have one minute to sum up, and then you will be applauded off the stage. It's a bit like the Oscars without the contemporary music. So each speaker will be fairly given five minutes. Please give them the respect and consideration they are due. We all have freedom of speech in Australia, don't we? Or, or is it just this room? Please, please listen to all of the speakers and at the end, write down a question. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the proceedings. I will announce each speaker by their name only and then there will be a slide behind them and they will explain their message. Without further ado, I would like to announce our first speaker to the lectern. Please welcome Hetty Johnston. We've got a mic, just what we need. I've got a big booming voice, don't really need a mic, but anyway. First of all, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh. So, it's kind of there. Oh, here. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Hope you didn't start my five minutes yet. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you, Jill, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming out and being interested in our country. It's, we're in a really bad place at the moment, I think. Um, as a nation, and which where we're going to head, which direction we're going to head, is going to um, is going to uh, you know impact on all of us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the indigenous um, custodians of the land on which we're meeting tonight, and um, pay my respect to their elders, past, uh, present, and uh, emerging. Um, look, I've got a background in business, so I used to run national companies and state-based companies. So I'm uh, I, I get this one-trick pony thing. So I'm going to I'm going to address that straight up. Um, in the, you know, these were very senior roles across, the, uh, uh, across those companies. Then I was uh, having a baby, so I took a couple of years off, and um, I got involved in a community campaign which brought down the Goss Labor government. Um, it was a toll road, and I learned. This was all a learning curve. This is the universe lining me up. So business, community campaigning, that, that teaches me about you know, what makes people tick and, and, and introduces me to social, um, to, to the needs of society. I was just so focused on making money, I didn't really have a lot of time for social issues, and I'm not proud of that, but that's a fact. Um, and then I got involved in politics after we won that. Senator Cheryl Kernow, who was the leader of the Australian Democrats, asked me to come and work for her. I did, and I did that because they were keeping the, you know what, honest, keeping people honest. Uh, but also, you had a conscience vote on every issue in the party, and I will never say yes when I mean no, or no when I mean yes. So that was very important to me. And then our daughter disclosed that she was sexually assaulted. She was nearly seven. And so all of that experience, writing speeches, media, uh, all of the contacts that I've had, the experience in Parliament, federal and state, all came to bear and I just stopped everything. And my husband and I started an organisation called Brave Hearts because there was nothing in this country at that time um, that dealt with this issue. No, no counselling, 
for kids and nothing and nothing for parents either. So that's my background. <laughs> Look, and over over those um, 30 years, I suppose that sort of spans about 30 years. I've picked up experience across a whole raft of things. So I don't come to this as a one-trick pony. Not forgetting when we started Bravehearts, talking about child sexual assault was like walking into a cockroach infested room in the middle of the night and flicking the switch on. Everybody just scattered. No one wanted to hear about this. And yet it affects one in five of our children today, before 15. One child every nine minutes. That's why I'm running. You want to know why I'm running? That's why I'm running. That's my main deal for running. Because someone has to stand in that house, has to stand in that Senate and fight for our kids because God knows the people that are in there now are not doing it. I'm telling you, I've sat with the Prime Minister and I've sat with the Attorney General and I've sat with the opposition and all sides of this place. And they all give you the platitudes, but none of them get up there and thump the table and demand a Royal Commission. And I know every man and his dog wants a Royal Commission, but this is the only legal instrument capable of dealing with this issue because it's the only legal instrument that is able to deal with the constitution and the jurisdictional issues and all the rest of it. It's the only way to fix it. If you're reading the papers, there's nobody that's arguing that this thing is a good, that it works. It's a mess and it's killing our children. It's tearing families apart. Women, men dying. And we're worrying about all kinds of other things that we shouldn't even, that don't even make the grade. If we don't care about our children, then who are we? If we don't want to fight for our children, if our children aren't the most important people in our lives, then who are we? So that's why I'm running and I, I intend to keep running. And I'm not on the side of fathers or mothers. I'm on the side of children. I get hammered by men's rights groups and women nutter groups. I get them all, right? But this is about children. I am only focused on the best interest of children. And yes, I'm interested also in... Yeah, in, uh, in what goes on. For the, there's a lot of misery and a lot of domestic violence and a lot of all sorts of things going on that need to be addressed and it's all part of this system. This family law system affects each and every one of us. It is costing us billion, 10.4 10 .4 or 11.4 billion dollars a year. That's the conservative estimate, right? That's about $20,000 a minute. Just think of that. I've got five minutes, right? We've just spent $100,000. And the thing is, we don't need to. We can fix this. Political transparency is also very important to me. That's why I was a Democrat. One minute. It, I'm just letting you know. That's why I'm going to rush. <laughs> Breathe. <gasps> really important that we don't sell our democracy. Really important that money doesn't get to buy, doesn't get to buy one house or two houses or or you know the whole shebang. It's really important that people understand that marketing works, advertising works, and not be sold by it. And I'm 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 horrified at what's happening. You know, is it China? Is it is it NRA? Is it Clive Palmer? I mean, where's this money coming from? That's just going to convince us all that they're telling us something we need to know. It's lies. Most of it is lies. The promises are going off into the wop wop, into the never never. So I guess. I just hope people think about how they're voting and I think they, I hope they understand that when you vote for a person, which Jewel has said really, really well, look at their background because what has happened before is a really good indicator about what's going to happen next. And with me, what happens next is integrity. Thank you, Hetty. Our second speaker tonight, would you please welcome to the lectern, Paul Scar. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, if I could thank Jewel for the invitation to come along tonight. I, I do appreciate it. And I note this is one of the only forums where I've had the opportunity to speak with a cross-section of the candidates for the Senate. Now, I'd also like to give a special recognition to a good friend of mine, Joe Lindgren, who, uh, served this Senate, who served this state with distinction in the, uh, in the Senate, and whose uncle, Neva Bonner, uh, was a hero of mine. And I want to start this presentation with the story about Neville. So I was 18 years old in the Young Liberals, and Neville Bonner came to speak to us. And I still remember this. He described how he was handing out how to vote cards for a Liberal Party friend in Ipswich. And a member of the Labor Party came up to him and said, Neville, why are you handing out for the Labor Party? Didn't you realise you people should be supporting us? 
And Neville didn't take kindly to that. So he took home the Liberal Party We Believe statement and he sat at his kitchen table and he read each value and he asked himself, do I believe in this? And as he read each value and ticked it, he got to the end, he ticked every value, he believed in each of them. So he joined the Liberal Party. And I've always remembered that lesson over the last 30 years. I've always remembered that. So I want to tell you what my values are. And you can find my values by going onto the LNP's website and looking at our constitution. And in that constitution is a value statement. And three of those values are my own words. I move the amendments at convention. The first is an explicit recognition of freedom of religion as one of the great freedoms of Western civilization. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association. I will always fight for those freedoms of the individual. What a disgrace, ladies and gentlemen, this week when we saw our Prime Minister ridiculed, ridiculed for worshipping in his church on Sunday. What a disgrace. I will always fight for freedom of religion. The second value, government which has a sustainable level of debt which does not impose an unfair burden on future generations. I am proud to stand for a party that has returned this budget to surplus. I am proud to stand for a party that is repaying the Labor Party's debt. There are too many people in politics who, don't, who believe that debt does not matter. Debt does matter. And we need to be prudent and frugal with our finances so we do not impose an unfair burden on future generations. The third value, a society which provides opportunity, not a government guarantee, but opportunity for all and support for those in need. I work for a mining company called Panos for the last 12 years. We built two mines in one of the poorest countries in the world, Laos. We lifted thousands of people up out of poverty. Thousands of people. Subsistence farmers. We lifted them out of poverty. That's what free enterprise can do, ladies and gentlemen. And you know what terrified me? We would sit around that boardroom table and we would see opportunities come up in Australia and we'd all look at each other and we'd say, gee, that's going to be hard. It's in Australia. It was easier for us to build a project in communist Laos than it is for a company to get a project off the ground in Australia. I want to make it easier, easier, not harder, easier for people who want to create wealth and provide opportunities to young people in this country. Easier, not harder. And I'll fight for that in the Senate each and every day. For me, this election comes down to people. It's all about people. I attended a rally Scott Morrison spoke at about a month and a half ago. And as I was leaving, I overheard a young lady say to Trevor Evans, the member for Brisbane, she said, I couldn't help but cry twice during Scott Morrison's speech. And I was intrigued. I wanted to know why. What, what caused you to go, go to tears? What, what could have caused that? And I introduced myself. Her name's Caitlin. And if you want to hear Caitlin's story or read about it, it's on my Facebook page. And Caitlin told me that in November last year, beautiful 24-year-old young lady, she got blind in one eye and started to get numb in her right leg. She went and saw her doctor. She was referred to a specialist. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at age 24. And the doctor told her that on and from 1 January, a drug to treat her particular type of multiple sclerosis was being added to the PBS. One of the 2,000 drugs that have been added to the PBS since the coalition government came to power. That drug would have cost her $120,000 a year, i.e. she would not have been able to afford it. She wouldn't have been able to take it. And I told Caitlin's story on my Facebook page. Yeah, give it a pause. It's given her hope. It's given her hope. And our government should give people hope. Not despair, hope. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Paul. The timing Nazi has struck. Are we allowed to say that in this room? Nazi. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the lectern our third speaker tonight, Malcolm Roberts. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you, Jewel, and your committee for organising a wonderful evening. And thank you all for attending. This is the best country on the planet. And it's slipping. And I want to talk about governance. And I also want to welcome the people on the internet right now. I'd like you to think about this little proposition. That a person living on welfare today in Australia is living longer, safer, easier than a king would have lived 200 years ago. And that's correct. Look around you. Think about what happens at home. Think about what happens in our society. We have material wealth that people would not have dreamt about just 100 years ago. And that's been due to human creativity, which depends upon freedom. But it also depends upon the driver of human progress, which is cheap energy. And for the last 170 years from the Industrial Revolution, energy has decreased in price relentlessly until 20 years ago. And since then, the price has doubled of electricity. And the reason for that is sloppy governance, atrocious governance in this country. China imports our coal, best coal in the world, and generates and sells electricity far cheaper than we can sell it here, even though we have wonderful generators. It's really simple. What, what drove our electricity price down was the fact that we had competitive federalism, which was guaranteed by our constitution. Competitive federalism meant that any state that develops an, an improvement, the other states copy and we drive down the price of electricity. One person, each state was responsible for the supply, the price and the reliability of electricity. That person, if he or she failed, the businesses went to other states. That happened. Joe Bioka Peterson abolished death duties and what happened? People came to Australia, then it came to Queensland. What happened then? the other states abolish death duties. Now we have a Labor Party wanting to put in place a death tax and a Greens Party also wanting to do the same. So let's have a look at what happened to our energy sector. We ended up with privatisation and corporatisation and there are another four factors which I'd like to share with you later if time permits. But when you have privatisation or corporatisation of an essential service, then you have price rigging because it's not a market anymore it used to be a market under competitive federalism where the states competed, but now it's a guaranteed game-rigging system called the national energy market, which is really a national energy racket. And both the major parties have caused that. And who's paying for this? In this state, we have a corporatization of our generators. And we still own the assets, but the state government is rigging the system and now taking out $1.4 billion a year in excess electricity charges. And who pays for it? Not only in our wallets, but also in the export of our jobs and our children's future. To comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol, John Howard went around the Constitution, his government went around the Constitution and, and stole farmers' property rights. So that's how we complied with the Kyoto Protocol. And yet to a true liberal, there is nothing more sacrosanct than, than secure property rights. What happened? No compensation, yet the Constitution says it should be there. So that's what I mean about sloppy governance. There are three great issues facing our country. Islamization. And that's allowed because of sloppy governance. The second, that, that's the third greatest issue. The second greatest, the second most powerful issue and threat is the UNization of our country. Energy, water, property rights, immigration, schools, education. But the biggest threat in this country is from within. It is, it is sloppy governance by the failed old parties. And that's what we want to change. So what I'd ask you to think about is then the three issues that are driving this election. One is cost of living. And you look time and time again, taxation policy, economic policy, budgets. You look time and time again at energy costs. That's what's driving our country backwards. You look secondly at immigration. Not only the values of our country, the selection of who we bring into this country, the numbers of who we bring into this country. That needs to be dramatically cut. The third area that, that, that drives the future of our country is the infrastructure in our country. We are building the future now, or rather, we are not building the future now. And that's where I wanted to draw attention to a book by Simone Weil, the French philosopher, who's, who called her book The Abolition of Parties. Because what's happened in this country is we have got a Senate that's fixated on parties and run by parties, not states anymore. We have got major parties that are working for the parties. And as Simone Weil said, the party becomes the, the objective. 
And what I'm very proud to say is that I work with the most remarkable woman I've met in Australian politics, the most remarkable person I've met because of her courage, her honesty and her passion for this country. And she doesn't use the party as the objective, she uses the party as a vehicle for Australia. That is Pauline Hanson. And that's why I have volunteered to work with Pauline Hanson for years now. And her, her amazing ability in the parliament to work in front of the cameras, behind the scenes, every way you can think of, Pauline never, never stops. And her values are vital to this country. Thank you, Malcolm. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the lectern our fourth speaker, Alona Lahn. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, and you can't even see me. <laughs> you might just have to stand here on the side. Stand here. Oh, okay, perfect. I just want to say I'm 47, and I don't really care what people think about me. So I'm going to join this club over here and say, I don't care. I'm going to talk about one of the most controversial issues to ever hit Australian shores. Vaccination. Vaccination and fluoro. I live on the beautiful Sunshine Coast. I'm a ex-successful businesswoman, a freedom of choice ambassador and a, protection of, a protector of our children in Australia. I am here today because I am very concerned about where we are heading. I'm concerned about the erosion of medical choice and rights, the polluting, pollution in our planet, the poisoning of our waters, the air, the chemicals, the pesticides and the insecticides. It all has to stop now or we don't have a future. Australia is overregulated. The red tape, BS, political correctness is out of control. The censorship and the, the silencing of the people. We deserve to have free debate, free speech, live debates, and everyone get a voice. It's not good enough. The people are merely now servants. Servants to big corporations who are lobbied or who lobby our Australian government. And so merely now we are slaves and servants to the people. We are free people, we are sovereign, and we deserve the right to have our say and our choice. The people are being mass drugged from womb to tomb. For those that don't know, pregnant women are now injected with disease while they're pregnant. At birth, babies are given vaccination. The schedule is now up to 17 different disease injections on the schedule. It is growing. By age four, our children are given 41 plus doses of 13 to 15 different disease injections. And that is over vaccination. We are causing mass health issues and we have an issue here in Australia. I attended the No Jab, No Pay, the social services, No Jab, No Pay Senate inquiry. That was my first experience with politics and with the government. And I have to say, I was gutted. I was destroyed at what I heard and what I saw. The level of corruption, the lies, the misinformation, government bodies that could not answer questions, the emitting of data, our le legislators who were wiping their hands free. We had 19 out of 20 people oppose that legislation, and yet that legislation was passed without change. Without change. There were over 3,500 submissions, well, most of those against the policy, and the government didn't hear our voices. They're not concerned. Here in Australia, we have an epidemic of disease. We have epidemics that everyone is ignoring of autoimmune issues, anaphylaxis, allergies, juvenile arthritis, cancer. Australia is number one in the world for cancer. How proud are we of that? And why do we have a number one rate of cancer here in Australia? That needs to be addressed. That's a serious health concern and we need to address that. Allergies, number one in the world here in Australia. It is a disgrace. We are damaging children and we are not looking after the health of our children and they are our future. And it is time the Australian government took accountability for the health issues that we currently face. We have epidemics and they need to be addressed. <sighs> My journey is I'm hepatitis B vaccine damaged. 
And you, the Australian government, want me to vaccinate my child with the very same vaccine that caused me health issues. It is not going to happen. Not while I'm here and not on my watch. And I will stand here and defend the freedom of choice. Thank you. For all those that don't have a voice. And those are the people that have vaccine injured children. It is the doctors, the midwives, the nurses, the scientists that are all silenced by our Australian government. And it's an absolute disgrace. The science is not settled at all. And it needs, we need an inquiry into this. It's a disgrace. We have mass health, health epidemics. I am very passionate. I'm a voice. I'm talking about the number one controversial issue here in Australia. And I, you know. I'm strong. I will have a voice and I will defend your children. <laughs> I was going to say to the cows come home because we have to. Okay, it's our future. I'm so passionate. I, I just can't believe that this is where we're at here in Australia. They have taken away our religious rights. Okay, the, the Australian government have taken away our choice. To get out of vaccination now, you have to have a medical exemption. To have a medical exemption, you have to have had anaphylaxis to that vaccine. Okay? There are issues within our vaccination schedule and it's time we address that. <laughs> so I want you to vote for me. I want to ask you to vote for the next party. Thank you, Alona. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our fifth speaker tonight, Senator Fraser Anning. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks, Jill, for putting this on. Um, I just make a few comments on uh, uh, our parties now registered, just in case anyone wants to vote above the line. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the last 12 days, we've had a, uh, a big rush to um, get people in uh, Senate. We now have candidates in every uh, state for the Senate, and um, quite a lot in the lower house as well. We're overwhelmed by 300 and odd people who uh, put their hand up to uh, stand for us, so, which is uh, very encouraging. Um, our party stands for, uh, or I stand for, uh, quite a lot of things. We've got a lot of policies. Uh, our uh, biggest problem in uh, the country, though, unfortunately, I think, is uh, the Muslim immigration, which uh, the other three parties, the, the two majors and the Greens, are all uh, very keen to uh, have open borders. An open border policy is no policy at all, and I think that uh, Muslim immigration is the greatest threat to this nation. And uh, if we don't stop it now, uh, we're going to end up like the rest of Europe. Uh, I think there's, uh, you know, we have three three threats uh, facing us right now. Uh, heading down the socialist road, uh, I, I don't know any socialist country in, on this planet that's ever worked, but uh, we have a a left-wing party, a socialist party, and a communist party running the country. So, uh, and if you keep on voting for those people, you're gonna keep on getting exactly the same result as we've had for the last 20 or 30 years. So those three things are a real uh, um, problem for us. I stand for free speech. We have a government that uh, has been in power now that's supposed to be a, a conservative party, and we still have 18C on the books. Now, uh, that that's just takes away your right to free speech. So. If they are a true conservative party, which they're not, then they would have abolished 18C years ago. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, we have problems with our, uh, with our pensioners. 30% of our pensioners are living below the poverty line. Uh, I, I believe that uh, if we could just treat our pensioners the way we treat our uh, fake refugees, uh, they'd have uh, a, a roof over their head, three meals a day, and plenty of money to spend, so uh, I don't know why we can't look after our return servicemen and our people in the same way. <laughs> now all, uh, all three parties uh, are pretty much beholden to the UN. The United Nations dic uh, dictates uh, who comes here uh, and how many of them come here. And I can tell you now there's, there's not many Christians among them. You know, we have South Africans being slaughtered on a daily basis over there. Uh, I've been calling for a, uh, you know, um, uh, refugees from South Africa to come here. Uh, 10,000 um, visas that we could do. We've done it for everyone else in the, in the world, but uh, we're happy to allow those people to be uh, slaughtered. And some of the uh, atrocities over there are 
a, a, a pretty frightening. Those people would be a much better settlers than a lot of the ones that we've got coming in here now. Uh, the other big problem we have is the Chinese buying up everything. Um, they've bought up our, our ports and our gas lines, uh, our farms. Uh, we can't continue to do that. What I would want to do is buy those things back. You know, uh, get our, get our own our own infrastructure. We can't keep on selling it off and expect that uh, these people are going to look after us because uh, you know I think that's a. Uh, a, a crazy idea and we just can't keep doing it and we can take those things back again. <laughs> and the other thing we need to do is start to uh, build some infrastructure of our own. We haven't built a dam in this country for a decent one for 35 years. We've got farmers out there who are doing it tough. Uh, we could drought proof the, the bush. I come from the bush and, uh, and I've seen all our cattle die and our sheep die over the years so we can, uh, we can change that by putting in the, um, uh, the Bradfield scheme plus other schemes. We can water the inland, we can become the food bowl of the world and uh, drought proof ourselves forever. We don't have to watch those animals die. Uh, so uh, just to finish up, I just say that uh, if we keep on voting the way we've been doing for the last however many years, we're not going to get a different result. We're going to have open borders, we're going to have uh, you know, these uh, huge taxation and uh, welfare schemes that we just can't afford. So uh, I highly recommend that we vote for um, minor parties and good conservative people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I have somebody's notes up here. Would you please welcome to the lectern our sixth speaker tonight, Gabe Buckley. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the Brisbane Community Forum and, and Voting Matters, and especially Jewel for putting on this evening tonight. And. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out here and, and getting involved because far too many people in this country are not involved in how the government runs and that apathy among Australians that we sometimes like to uh, pride ourselves upon has led to a fairly nasty situation where the government is now out of control. What we are hearing a lot of this evening is talking about symptoms. This is wrong, that's wrong, this is how we fix it. Here's some band-aids, let's make some more laws. No, we don't want to do that. Somebody's dinner's ready. A battery's died on a microphone, but... <laughs> Not to worry, I can deal with that situation. Our, uh, our government, our laws, over the last, I don't know, 100 years since we first uh, obtained a cursed federal government and lost our competitive federalism that we had amongst the colonies, we have grown our government, we have grown our bureaucracy, we have grown our laws to a point where no one, not the most learned High Court Justice, not the most tenured university law professor, no one can understand this beast. No one knows what goes on in there. No one can fully understand the whole breadth and depth of what we've unleashed upon ourselves through that apathy. Now when things get so complex, so big, with so many moving parts that no one really understands how they work, we start to get a little bit mystical about them. They start to develop powers and that provides a little opening for corruption to get in. People want to get in there. They want to start using those powers to get you to do things for them, to live the way you want them. They want you to live, to pay them your income because, oh, they're doing all these favours for you, aren't they? So we're hearing a lot about left and a lot about right when in reality left and right are fairly meaningless and archaic terms these days. The battle on nearly every political front 
today is between, as we've heard, freedom and authoritarianism. Now, it is freedom that underpins the fundamental dignity of humanity. Without freedom, we have no agency, which is the ability to make our own decisions and accept the consequences, whether we're reaping rewards or, or facing, facing the music in some way. We should have the right to do that. That's agency, and that's the fundamental underpinning of human dignity, is the, the ability to live your life as a human being. Now, when we start creating laws and uh, making regulations, we take that agency away from people. We render them less than human. We're succumbing to slavery every time we allow a law to be passed over us. Good people don't need laws. They do good things regardless of what the law says. Bad people find ways around the law. They're useless. Stop making more of them. When our government gets so big, and I think it was Oscar Wilde well over 100 years ago that said, uh, the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. <laughs> when the government gets so big, when it gets so self-serving that it has become its own entity, we believe in its powers and it's ruling us where it should work for us, not as our master. So the Liberal Democrats, exist to reduce the size and scope of government, to get it off our backs, to get it out of our wallets, to get it to, to leave us the hell alone, to live our lives, we're not hurting anyone, go away. Thank you, Gabe. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our seventh speaker for the night, Lyle Shelton. Thanks very much, Kevin, and thanks very much, Jewel, for organising tonight, and ladies and gentlemen, for being part of this democracy in action. I'd like to echo Paul's very warm um, uh, acknowledgement of my Senate candidate uh, running mate, Joanna Lindgren, and uh, I agree with everything he said about her. It's been a pleasure to be working with her on our ticket. And uh, I think it, it speaks volumes, the fact that she's found a home in Australian Conservatives when uh, the LNP twice passed over her for a winnable spot uh, on their ticket there. So um, I, th I think that's just uh, something to note. Well, we're here tonight, and I'm running for the Senate tonight because I believe that uh, Canberra and our politics uh, is very much broken, that we have a deficit of common sense, and that's because we have a deficit of truth uh, in our nation. Many years ago, a man by the name of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who you might have heard of, spent some time in a Russian gulag because he criticised the regime that he was a part of. He was a soldier in the Russian army. And he found his way to the West eventually after he wrote a famous book called The Gulag Archipelago. And he was asked to give a lecture in 1978, having spent several years now in the West observing the West. And he said that whilst communism is a terrible, terrible totalitarian regime, uh, that he could see the seeds of, of the West's own destruction within it. And he said the problem with the West, this is in 1978, is that its leaders don't have the will and the courage to defend the values of the West. And I believe that's why we're in this current moment of crisis in our nation that so many of us have talked about. We are a nation that is endowed with the most abundant natural resources of almost any country on the planet. We have enormous coal and uh, uranium and uh, many other natural resources, and yet... At a time like this, we are having a debate over whether we can keep the lights on, to use the words of our energy minister, Angus Taylor. It should not even be under discussion. We have an energy crisis in a nation with the most abundant resources. We've squandered our competitive advantage. We have a problem with freedom of speech and freedom of... Thank you. Don't waste my time. <laughs> we have a problem with freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Under a conservative government, and there are many great exceptions in the LNP, and I'm sure Paul is one of those, and I know many, but as a group unit, they have been unable to defend freedom of speech and freedom of religion. Fraser has already referred to uh, 18C of the Federal Racial Discrimination Act, which makes it uh, a crime to offend and insult someone. That should never be the bar for action. That, inciting violence, sure, but not offending and insulting someone in a free society. Freedom of religion, well, we just passed this uh, same-sex marriage uh, thing, and uh, yes, that was a 
democratic decision, but it was agitators within the Liberal Party that forced the Liberal Party to change its position on this and redefine marriage and family with all sorts of consequences for freedom of speech and freedom of religion in this nation. Now, if you want to say that the only form of marriage, or that the correct and the true form of marriage, which I'm going to say tonight out loud, uh, sorry I'm being bigoted and all that sort of stuff, but the, the true form of marriage is between a man and a woman. The family is mum, dad and the kids. But in Tasmania, a, a Roman Catholic Archbishop was taken to a tribunal under a conservative uh, government down there and under a conservative federal government for, for saying just that in a, in a leaflet uh, of Catholic teaching to Catholics. Now, this is happening under a conservative government. We've closed 10 coal-fired power stations under a conservative, supposedly conservative government and not replaced the baseload generating capacity. Do you know what the disease is in this country? Do you know what I think it is? I think it's something called cultural Marxism. Now, if you think that I'm being a conspiracy theorist, have a look at Robert Menzies' uh, Forgotten Speeches, ed edited by David First Roberts, and uh, all the liberals should read it. But in it, he talks about communism and its aim to destroy the family. Well, the key goal of Marxism is to destroy the family, destroy religion, destroy private property. Uh, we've seen that with our vegetation management laws. Destroy the nation. Yes, open borders are a big part of the Green Left's agenda, and I'm sure the Labor Party. Well, I'm pleased to be part of a party that has principles. Um, and, uh, you know, not, unlike another Marx by the name of Groucho, uh, it's not the case of having principles that uh, you don't like and we can give you others. We have principles. Limited government, personal responsibility, free enterprise. If there's tax cuts on the table, we're going to take them every time. Stronger families, civil society, our Judeo-Christian ethic. These are the things that we at the Australian Conservatives stand for. And my encouragement to you is uh, take out third-party insurance, Vote Australian Conservatives. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Our eighth speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rod Fox. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to show respect to all these people up here. They're um, certainly very good in the way they present. I uh, probably won't be quite as polished, but I'll give it a go for uh, what I can. Um, for quite some time, I wasn't even listed on the electoral roll. Didn't like what the government did. Soon turns out you don't get a say if you don't do that. So I am enrolled now. Um, I'm an ex-Air Force uh, electrical fitter, um, 15 years addition to that with uh, defence aviation and uh, or contractors and um, resource companies uh, writing policies and procedures is what I've done. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, I've got two wonderful children, but like a lot of people, uh, been through the divorce court, through family law, lost everything. There's something wrong with the system. This has been mentioned a couple of times. There's something wrong with a lot of systems. Um, so I stand this election for the Australian Better Families Party. Our job is to uh, our job is to ensure that Australian families benefit before all others from government policy. Okay. Now, benefits of better family law. Okay, you'd have your rights as a parent upheld. You wouldn't have it taken away from you. Um, amicable communications between both parents to benefit the children. Okay. A lot of people probably understand exactly what I'm talking about with this. Okay. Preserve family wealth for the family, not give it to solicitors and lawyers and the, and the system. When you get to 50 and you have everything taken away from you and you have to start again, you soon know what that's all about. Okay. Prevent financial ransoming of children. Prevent abuse of the child support system. That's quite a common one. If you have a look at the stats of people that have died that have child support accounts, you soon understand what that one's all about. Okay. And to be, uh, not to be falsely accused of domestic violence. Those stats don't get reported. Police put things down as uh, if they find that uh, not having a go at women, but if they find that a woman has made a false accusation, it's just put down as a uh, non-disturbance. Okay. We need to remove gender out of DV. Okay. Um, 
need to get uh, mediation and counselling into place before it even gets to DV. Now, um, I've had two partners of legal firms that told me that six years ago, they told the Queensland Government they pleaded not to put the changes in because they would lose the real cases, the real DV cases would fall through the cracks. That's exactly what's happened. You get a lot of people that there is no DV there, there's just claims that have been made and yet media now report a lot of deaths, a lot of damage. So we need to get back to what the real cases are and not the fake ones. Okay. But families have other challenges too. They have mental health. They have homelessness. How many homeless are there in Brisbane? I've heard it somewhere around 18, 1,800. Okay. That's just for Brisbane. Okay. Aged care. Okay. With reports of uh, lack of transparency and of abuse in the aged care facilities, who's concerned about their parents? Look forward. Who's concerned about yourself? <laughs> I know I am. Now, being ex-defence, better veteran services. These are policies that we've got. Okay. Um, now, this one is personal to me, especially with, uh, with Anzac Day coming up on Thursday. Okay. Um, there are people in this country, like we as a people, we allow our government to send our young, healthy men and women off into war zones, defending us and defending other people. Okay. And um, if they're not physically injured or killed, um, they're exposed to events that you and I don't even want to think about. Okay. My brother was a photographer in the army. He's told me some of the stories and he said they were the good ones. Okay. Now, there are people that have come back and been dumped because they're damaged. 28 odd thousand of them living on less than 63% of the minimum wage. That's their, that's their compensation. And all they've asked for is to get minimum wage. Who could live on 63% of the minimum wage here? So, um, yeah. And the other thing is, is that how we treat them? These people have come back, they're defending us, and that's how we treat them. Okay, now we have a whole range of other, uh, of other policies as well. You know, all for families, uh, adoption reform, community childcare, community employment, national youth service, juvenile justice reform. Any young kids in jail is not a good place for them. It's a waste of life. But can we get them out and get them productive? These are the things that we're trying to, uh, that we're going to get in and, and improve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rod. Our ninth and final speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jan Pukalis. Yes, I'm Jan Pukalis. I represent the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia. Uh, we're a 31 year old political party. I've ran for them five times in the last 20 years. I wasn't political before then and I also didn't vote, well I had been voting but then decided, you know, it wasn't worth voting, there's no one to vote for. Then I came across um, CC, skeptical for about two years because, um, you know, I couldn't believe it, that they would be telling the truth or they had, would have any cred credibility. And um, so I went down to Melbourne with my husband to check them out and realised they're the real deal and they think really big. Um, they're not trying to just tweak something or even have small government. Um, we need to take responsibility for the future of the country and their posterity. You know, so not just, it's not just about me and my stomach, but what are we doing for the future generations? And they were warning of a systemic global financial crisis, and we, and we still are. But I want to start with this very short uh, poem by Charles Harper, who was a convict in Australia. He, sorry, he wasn't a convict. He was the first generation of Australians uh, that were born, like obviously white Australian, currency lad they called him. 
uh, he, his, both of his parents were convicts. Uh, it's called this southern land of ours. With clowns to make our laws. Sorry, and this is in 1863, or around that time. With clowns to make our laws and knaves to rule us as of old. In, in vain our soil is rich, in vain tis seamed with virgin gold. But the present only yields us naught, the future only lours till we have a braver manhood in this southern land of ours. What would pygmy and statesmen but a new world prospect blast by chaining enterprise and thought to the misyielding past with all its misery for the mass and fraud upholding power. But we'll have a braver system, sorry, a braver manhood in this southern land of ours. And lo, the unploughed future, boys, may yet be all our own, if hearts that love this native soil determine this alone, to sow its fields with crops of truth and border them with flowers. Then we'll have a nobler system in this southern land of ours. And so what, the, um, what he's talking about is not a physical thing about the land, yes, we, we, we all know we need to grow food and have food security, water security, energy security and that kind of thing. But to change the economic system, that's what he was on about and that's what the CEC is, is um, carrying on. We have a five point uh, program. Some of you would have received it on the way in and I'm gonna speak briefly on each of these points. The first one is for Glass-Steagall. It's bank separation, and it's the policy of separating the commercial banks from the investment banks. And the reason we need to do this is because we're facing a new global financial crisis worse than the 1930s depression. And we need to do what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in 1933 to stop the banks from gambling with other people's money and stop the private banking system from getting hold of uh, from getting a bailout uh, for their private gambling debts. The, the, the Glass-Steagall Bill of 1933 um, not just ended the depression, but we had a safe banking system for 66 years until Bill Clinton repealed that bill. Now, the CEC isn't... One minute. Oh, God. The CEC isn't just talking this stuff. We've written the legislation, Banking System Reform, Separation of Banks Bill. This will veto the bail-in bill, which will steal your deposits when the crash happens, just like they did in Cyprus and Spain and Greece and Portugal and Ireland. Now, we've written the legislation for a national bank in 1995, which we put in this book, What Australia Must Do to Survive the Depression. So we weren't just born yesterday. We've upgraded it to include derivatives and we've put in this manual which we produced this year. Um, the next financial crash is certain, end the bankers' dictatorship, time for Glass-Steagall, bank separation and a national bank. We've also got large-scale infrastructure projects outlined in this. The New Silk Road becomes a world land bridge and um, we need to work with other nations for economic development, cooperation. Peace comes with development. So, that's it. <laughs> so if, you want a qualified, if you want a qualified candidate, vote for me. Thank you, Jan. Well done, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, please give all our nine speakers a round of applause. We started a couple of minutes late tonight, but I believe we are on time and we plan for at least 20 minutes of Q&A. Now, due to the nature of the room and the compact way you are set up tonight, I'm going to ask this gentleman to come outside right now and anybody else has written down a question, would you please come out beside me and I will let you ask that question. And anybody else who's written down a question, please join me on the left-hand side, my left, your right. What's your name, sir? Thanks. What's your question and to whom, please, Mason? Uh, it is to Senator Roberts. Uh, Mr. Roberts, you claim to be anti-Muslim. It's your party by nature. 
uh, nation, sorry, ran Emma Eros, who is Muslim that supports Sharia law. Can you please explain? <laughs> I'd be very happy to explain it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. What's your name? Mason. Mason, thank you very much. One Nation is about Australia. One Nation. And what we have to be very careful of is that we have a number of people in this country who don't deserve to be here. They're hardcore Islamists, they're radical Islamists, and they're extreme Islamists. We also have a number of people who were labelled as, as being of a religion by birth. Now those people didn't get a choice, they were born into that. And I've got a very good friend here, David Truman, who can talk for hours knowledgeably about Islam. And we are very, very proud to welcome Emma Eros into our, our party because she is Australian first. She was born here. She didn't have a choice in what, was, what religion she was labelled as. Just as many Catholics and Protestants don't have a choice. They carry that throughout life. Now, Emma, number one, is an Australian. She's a proud Australian. She's a successful Australian. And if we don't welcome people like that into our party and into our country, then we will push them away and drive them the other way. We don't want radical Islam here. We will oppose it. We've spoken out very strongly against it. But we welcome any Muslims who put Australia first and put their, their, um, their whole livelihood into this country and abide by our values and our law. And Emma does not abide by Sharia law and does not, does not uh, pronounce it. Thank you for the question, Mason, and thank you, Malcolm. We have a question from Lloyd. Um, question to you, Gabe. Um, tonight was about uh, free speech, trust, proof, uh, you know, truth and honesty. Could you give us uh, the Liberal Democrats' insight into uh, the real freedom and free speech uh, process? Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, Free speech is, is a very interesting one, isn't it? Everybody seems to want it, but no one seems to, to like having other people having it. Uh, it's, it's a scary thing because when we have free speech, we accept the full consequence of everything that we say. If we start creating laws about what people can and can't say, we are essentially creating a government mandated framework for discussion. So if you can't think of anything more outrageous than somebody else telling you what to think, what you can say, then I, I'm at a loss for words because this is the, that fundamental underpinning of our, our human dignity, that ability to express ourselves, everything hangs off that, our freedom of speech, our freedom of association, our freedom of religion, that all hang off that ability to be able to express ourselves uh, directly, honestly, and if people say things that we don't like, who cares? Sticks and stones, mate, suck it up. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you, Gabe. And we have a, a quick comment from Paul. Uh, Peter. Paul. 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 Sorry. Not Mary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the flip side of freedom of speech, and I just want to echo what Gabe said, is your freedom to hear, right? John Stuart Mill, who wrote the classical work on liberty about the fundamental freedoms that we believe in, including freedom of speech, said one of the arguments, one of the key arguments for freedom of speech is that you have the right to hear. Hear all the people here and make up your own minds. Better understand why you believe what you believe in. That's one of the benefits of freedom of speech. The flip side is your freedom to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. We have a question from Carrie, please. Who is it to? Um, hi, this is for Rod Fox. My question is, we are seeing one um, woman killed each week through domestic violence in Australia. What research are you basing your ideas about false claims of domestic violence on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your name was sorry? Harry. Harry. Thank you for the question. Very good question. I'm basing it on 
lived experience. Not just from myself, but from other people that I've seen at the family court that I've met throughout life. There's a lot of people that have said they've been falsely accused. I know exactly what it's like. So that's where it's coming from. There are a lot of stats out there, um, but as I said, the police don't keep a lot of stats if a woman has been found alive. When you have two police cars come down to a park at night because somebody's called them and told them that a person is stealing the children and the, and the police get there ready to throw you on the ground and handcuff you and then find out what the true story is okay? and then they just mark it up. They won't give you a report, they just mark it up as non-disturbance. Thank you, Rod, and i Thank you, Carrie, for that question. Um, look, I think that both men and women suffer domestic violence. There's no question about it. But there is also no question that women are the ones that suffer the most. Women are the weaker. Women are getting beaten up. Women are dying. But we're not, we're not getting those from our lived experience. Well, we are. But they're also recorded in statistics. It's not pulled from somewhere. I mean, we need to have integrity and truth. If, we're going to, if you're going to run for parliament, then stick to the facts. You know, you might have a passion for something. God, I do. I could say all kinds of things that I feel in my heart, but I can't prove it, so I don't say it. And I think we should expect that from every single one of us in that house, because that's part of our problem. There's no truth. It's just all... I was just going to swear then, but I won't. I'll, I'll go with Brian. Yeah, thank you. Can I make Thank you, Betty. And you are allowed to swear here. It's not like it's live or anything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, for your question and Hetty for your comments. I know from talking to many, many people around this country, and I know from especially from Leith Erickson there, that men and women are suffering violence. Men and women are perpetrating violence. We know that. The, the leader of our party, Pauline Hanson, has been talking about this for years. She succeeded in getting the first review of the family law system in Australia starting last year. This is a mess, and the people who lose are the kids, the mothers, the fathers, but it can be quite easily gained because the people who win are the lawyers. And that's what has to change. Because make no mistake, Eddie, all over this country, m m uh, fathers are dying, suiciding, and it's overwhelming, and Lee can give you a very good update on that. The Did figures are there. angry about the children. I certainly do, and that's why, I, that's why I just mentioned the kids. They're the first ones I mentioned who lose. No, you're always talking about the men. Then I say mothers, children and fathers. How many mothers in here? How many mothers in here? How many would agree with what I just said? Women are doing this. Thank you, people. We have a very brief question. I don't normally allow two bites of the cherry, but we have another one here. Very quickly. <laughs> All right, this one's the phrase running, and we know already what your policies are on the drought-stricken farmers, but this is a major issue that I think most Australians will agree with, that they are the backbone of Australia. So how exactly does your policy really affect them? Can we have a little bit more detail on that? And I know most Australian farmers are the families of Australia with which we rely on. Well, thanks for that question. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. The, uh, all these problems we have with the droughts in, in the bush we could have alleviated 100 years ago or 80 years ago. Um, the Romans did it 2,300 years ago. Their aqueducts are still running now. So if you take from the Tully to the, to the um, Herbert and the Burdekin to Hell's Gate Dam uh, and then down into the, the Tate and the Lind and the Walsh and the uh, Ironslee, all those big rivers, we can run water all the way down through the central part of Queensland, uh, right down past Winton. There's millions of acres there that could be irrigated. So it's the most fertile soil in the world and we have the most water in the world. If Queensland, uh, North Queensland was a country, it'd be the wettest country on earth. And we still haven't been able to manage to take that water and put it across the range, which is, is quite easy to do. It's not only is it easy to do it, it can all be done gravity fed. Uh, the original Bradfield scheme had pumping because we didn't have the, the tunnelling machines that we have now. So we can gravity feed from 845 metres, which is uh, the Tully, all the way down to the Hell's Gate and then across through the range into all those other rivers, the Tate, the Lynn, the Walsh, 
uh, the Cloncurry and down into the Flinders, and we can water millions and millions of acres. Um, if you have a look at California now, in the San Joaquin Valley and the Sacramento Valley, uh, they're watering, they're irrigating 10 million acres of, of pure desert. Our country is way, way better than that, and we have more water than that. So we can become the food bowl of the world, we can produce uh, crops and, and feed the world and increase our, uh, our uh, viability with the amount of money that we'll put back into the coffers. The Murray-Darling gives us a couple of uh, 22, million, uh, 22 billion a year. This is about three or four times as big as the Murray-Darling. So it can be done and it should be done and that's what I'll be uh, advocating for in the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of getting our questioners up and running, if you have another question for a candidate or you wish to talk, we have some time after the Q&A session. I'd like to continue with our questionnaires. Our questionnaires. And your... Donella. Donella. Who is your question for? My question is actually for he. Uh, as much as a lot of people tonight here have actually brought up the family law system, uh, basically, we're hearing everyone, everyone here tonight, and so many people out in the public actually complaining about the system. But when it comes down to it, what are you going to do to fix it, Hattie? Thank you. I'll continue what I've been doing for 22 years, and that is relentless, relentlessly banging the table and trying to find change. Now, the only way, as I said before, that we're going to be able to fix this system is to have a Royal Commission because it's the only legal instrument capable of digging into the weeds of this thing. This is broken from the state level to right through to the federal level, from the police, the child protection level, the kids are not getting heard, the biggest problem is children not getting heard. Back in uh, 1997, there was a ALRC report number 94 called Seen and Heard. Recommendation number 92 of that report was to introduce child advocacy centres where when a child discloses, because my main focus is on children, so I'll keep going back to that, right? When a child discloses that the child is interviewed by a multidisciplinary team, uh, witnessed by a multidisciplinary team, but a forensic interviewer, so a psychologist who understands the law and all the rest of it, but also understands child's, ch children's development, it's really hard to get a child to disclose. It's really hard to get enough evidence to meet the police threshold of, you know, beyond reasonable doubt. It's really unusual, actually, to have a disclosure of a child being upheld by moving to a charge and then moving on to a, to a, um, to a conviction. It's not so much unusual, but it's, it's more normal that they don't. Most allegations don't go forward. There's the problem. So that's what a child advocacy centre will do. It will be able to clarify really quickly at the, early, at the onset whether... And it's about the child telling the truth. It's not even about mum or dad. It's about finding out what's going on. Children only tell, miss, you know, get it wrong or tell lies between two and five percent of time, right? Most of the time, the most ones likely to tell the truth are the children, and yet they're the ones nobody's listening to. And a child advocacy centre will turn that around, so we don't have to listen to the lies and the deceit of mum and dad because they both do it. Don't kid yourself, you know, they do it. So what we need to do is we need to find the truth and we need to find it early. So children are not making disclosures time and time and time again. And we need that Royal Commission desperately. And while I draw breath, we will get that Royal Commission. I swear to God, I will thump and I will do whatever I have to do till we get it because there are thousands of children suffering every day because we don't have it and we need it. And it needs to be about children, not about us adults. <laughs> Thank you, Hetty. And we have something uh, which is going to be a first tonight. We're going to ask all the candidates... Hi, Sandy. We're going to ask all the candidates a single question, and the only answer required is a yes or a no. <laughs> Let's see how this goes. Good evening, ladies and gents. I'm passionate about the future of Australia, and that is what our children are going to be, the future. OK? We cannot afford to destroy our children, so the one question for all candidates is, do you support the Safe Schools Program? No, absolutely not. You're not a No. 
No. No. No. No. No. No. I do. Some of it. Not all. Can I just say, we just had a debate about freedom of speech, and someone's just said, I can only give a yes or no answer. Can I exercise my freedom and answer the question as I like? No? Thank you, everybody, for answering the best way you could. Thank you so much. Our next question. This is Katie. What is, who is your question, Director George? My question, uh, well actually first, there has been a lot of talk about uh, freedom to speak and Paul, you're speaking about freedom to hear. What about, freedom, what about freedom for parents to hear from other parents with vaccine injured children or ones that have unfortunately died? <laughs> what about freedom to choose what you feel is right for your children? What about your freedom to parent your children the way that you feel is best, including natural therapies? How is that freedom? What about the freedom of children across this whole country to grow up without the scourge of diseases which used to decimate thousands and thousands of children across the world? What about that freedom? What about that freedom? This anti-vaccination stuff is nonsense. Sure, get up and speak about it. I would speak love to about speak about it. It is dangerous nonsense. Dangerous nonsense. And I support... Sorry, I haven't finished yet. I support reasonable public health measures to protect the children of this country, and I always will. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing freedom of speech to take place. I will allow you a brief response. 30 seconds. We have four or five more questions, but only five minutes left in Q&A. 30 seconds. Vaccines cause death, disability and harm. The science is not settled, and the government know it and the authorities know it. Where is the compensation scheme for those that are damaged by a vaccine? Exactly. Vaccine injury is real and it's right. Exactly. And to forcibly mandate vaccines is a crime against humanity. 100%. And it needs to be stopped and addressed. This is about a parent's right to choose. Vaccines can make, contain formaldehyde, MSG, neomycin, aluminium, mercurol. It, they contain adjuvants that should never be injected into a child or a baby. And at day one, babies are given hepatitis B vaccine for a disease that is low prevalence here in Australia and primarily transferred through sex, drugs and tattoos. And that's a disgrace. Thank you, Alona. Ladies and gentlemen, this is freedom of speech. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> My question is to any of the candidates, if you have a good answer, I need help. Uh, are people with our voting system able to vote more than once? <laughs> and how can we stop it if they do it? Yes. Using technology. Thank you. Sounds like a very basic question. Would anybody like to answer that as quickly as they can? Thank you, Malcolm. People are not allowed to vote more than once, but people do vote more than once. And we need to stop it. We need voter identification. Complete voter identification. And, and who, which party brought in voter identification in the state election before last? Campbell Newman's party. And who removed it? One of the first things they did. Labor Party. And who votes Preference often? against them, Malcolm? Who, who? preference against Campbell Newman? Who preference against every sitting LNP member at the last state election? One nation. One nation. We, we, one nation. We preferenced against both parties because, and we, we don't actually preference against it because that's another myth that these people spread. We don't preference. You preference. You allocate numbers. You allocate numbers. That's the truth. Now, now hang on. You've raised something there, Paul. You've, you've raised something there. We also preference against the Labor Party suggested our people, our voters vote against the Labor Party. Why? Because your party would not talk to us. Your party voted for, your party preference 
uh, Jackie Trad. Your party caused us to lose four seats. If you'd been smart and talked to us, we would be in coalition government now, and the Labor Party would not be putting through its abortion nonsense and its other heinous bills, including the staggering of Arnie, uh, Keep saying that. Keep saying that. Keep saying that. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure you do your research before you vote. Use your vote wisely. Roger, your question is directed towards? Jan. First of all, I do want to thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate all your very perspectives, particularly those who had the courage to say something against the greater mood. So I salute you even if I don't agree with you, I salute you. No, honestly, I mean that. No, no. Jan, I don't, this question I put to you, I've read a lot of CEC stuff over the years. I think your Glass-Steagall uh, position is excellent, as does Paul Keating, funnily enough. But what does concern me about your Silk Road concept is that it involves a great deal of trust in China. Now, I think, I don't want to go into too many details, but China has not proven to be of great benefit to any African nation that I'm aware of. And they are raping Africa like crazy. Now, I need to ask you, why do you think, if you do, that China is so worthy of the trust of the Silk Road Doctrine? Thank you for the question. Well, first of all, this new Silk Road or the Belt and Road Initiative, as it's called now, is the CEC's initiative. Um, it was on, for those that don't know, it's a corridor of economic development emphasising massive infrastructure projects around the world, but each country is responsible for their own development. So each country would have to have a banking system and a government of buying for the people that directs credit into nation building projects like the Bradfield Scheme, uh, Bradfield Scheme, the Fitzroy River Scheme and so forth. We've got 19 projects, 19 water projects for Australia. So China has, has Glass-Steagall in there. They have a separate uh, Glass-Steagall principal banking system and they've had it since 1993. So for the last nearly 30 years, they've used credit to lift 800 million people out of poverty. They're not trying to take over the world. They never have. They've never been an empire. They're not bombing anybody. They don't have foreign, um, like they don't have, like we have Americans and Pine Gap in Australia. Um, to, we don't have Chinese bases here. And each government of Australia is responsible for privatisation and deregulation of of our resource, and you saw what happened to Gough Whitlam when he tried to nationalise the resources, buy back the farm, he called it. So we need to, we need to nationalise our resources, buy back the farm sort of thing, and work with other nations like China, like the whole um, America and Britain buy up huge tracts of land and stop it from development, turn it into um, wilderness or mining for their own interests. Right? China doesn't do that. So, and they are developing Africa, by the way, building railways, dams, nuclear power stations. And we ought to do it here, stop being a colonialist backwater. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jan. We'll move along with the questions, ladies and gentlemen. We are one or two minutes behind. I'm going to try and allow a couple of more questions. Please approach the candidates after the Q&A. We are behind time. Please approach after the question and answer and ask your question. But I have another gentleman here. What's your name? Sorry. <coughs> your question is two. Uh, Any one of about three or four. <laughs> ask one. Sorry. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank the nine candidates here tonight. One thing's very clear is that you're all very passionate about this wonderful country of ours, so thank you for that. Um, Continue on the theme of mandatory vaccinations, uh, directed slightly differently. There's any one of about three or four candidates here have stated uh, quite clearly that one of the foundation stones of your policies is freedom of speech, and I would like to uh, get one of you, at least, uh, to stick your neck out and state what your position is on mandatory vaccinations. 
It's pretty simple, like uh, most of the other Liberal Democrats' policies, the government should leave us alone. Whether you think vaccines are dangerous or whether you think they are safe and effective, it doesn't matter. You know, you're entitled to your opinion, you're entitled to decide what gets put into your body and the bodies of your children. And, uh, you know, getting up here and, and slaving each other off as to whether our, uh, our reading of the science is... You know, we're not scientists. We've, we've read it, we've got our opinions, but uh, you know, that, that's all we can do. And we are the ones who have to make our decisions. We are the ones who have to live our lives. Let us make our decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. I'm very sorry. The other people here waiting, can you approach the person that you had the question for after we sign off? We will be staying here much later. <coughs> well, we can continue a bit longer if you wish to. Yes. Do we want to continue a bit longer? Yes. yes. How much time have we got? The bar has to close. It's on the bar. We can do another 10 minutes. How about that? I'm going to ask Lyle very quickly to come up. You had something to say when that last topic was brought up, and I've given a fair bit of airplay to some other people, but I'm going to give some airplay on this side. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I vowed I wouldn't do this, but uh, when the comments were made about China and the previous question, uh, I just felt I needed to say this. Um, the uh, Chinese government, by their own admission, um, Xi Jinping is, is a, a someone who pursues Stalinist policies, um, I think we need to be very, very concerned about where China's going. Um, uh, their ambitions in the South China Sea, the militarisation of that uh, is a real, real worry. I think one of the best things that the Morrison government did uh, with uh, the assistance of uh, US Vice President Mike Pence is reopen the naval base at Manus Island. Um, that's a, a necessary deterrent. Um, I've seen what's going on in the South Pacific in places like Fiji, uh, the new airport at Nandi, uh, they're trying to buy property, islands over there, and, and get influence. Now, you know, we need to be friends with China, obviously, but we can't be blind to their ambition. And uh, by their own admission, Xi Jinping is pursuing Stalinist policies. Now, Stalin was a butcher and a murderer. Uh, they still hang Mao Zedong's photo in uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, this guy killed 60 million of his own people. I think we need to be very, very concerned about a government that is, that is pursuing these sort of policies. Um, you mentioned uh, in your speech about uh, cultural Marxism and the attack on marriage. I was just wondering um, if you, as uh, if you became a senator, would you look into repealing no-fault divorce, considering that is a classic example of the cultural Marxist attack on marriage. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one. Um, you know, it wasn't uh, the homosexual community that uh, has, has destroyed marriage somehow magically. Uh, it's been on a terrible down uh, turn for you know, 30 or 40 years, and it's us heterosexuals that have done the most damage to marriage. You know, the issue of no-fault divorce, when that went through the parliament in about 1974, I believe, um, and I might have, it was around about that time, uh, Lionel Bowen was the Attorney General, Labor under Gough Whitlam, and um, an amendment was put to that act uh, when it was going through the parliament, which John Howard, Paul Keating uh, and several, Philip Ruddock, several others um, supported, which was to take the, um, the, se the separation period uh, before a no-fault no divorce could be procured uh, from one year to two years. Now, statistics show that if a couple is able to work things out within a period of a year, often the marriage will last. Uh, now, we, you know, none of us have perfect marriages, and my wife is here tonight, <laughs> a 20... Six, seven years, 26 years tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Uh, I think I'm just wrecked our 26th wedding anniversary. Uh, but um, the reality is all of us have, it, have issues. I mean, I don't seem to be perfect, and Wendy will attest to that. But the statistics show if, if people are able to be encouraged to at least try and work it out, stay together, obviously where there's no violence, um, but uh, you can make uh, it work. And uh, John Howard, Paul Keating, uh, and Philip Ruddick and others uh, tried to move this amendment to extend that period from 
one year to two years. You know what? It failed by one vote. And uh, since then, our divorce rate has skyrocketed. It's gone, climbed up to almost 50%. It's falling a little bit now. That's good. But uh, we talk about the kids, and uh, I'm, I share Hetty's passion for kids. If only we could find a way as men and women and, and as a society to, to, um, to favour marriage and family and public policy and not demonise it all the time and not make it look like you're a wowser if you, if you stay with the same woman uh, or if you think that kids deserve wherever possible to have their mother and their father. You're not even allowed to say that now because that's bigotry. Um, we have a tax system that's biased against uh, parents who want to care for their children in the home. These are the issues uh, that go to marriage and family in this country and these are the things that we need to look at. So yes, I think no-fault divorce has played a terrible role. I do think it needs a rethink and I think if we really do care about our kids, we'll start to rebuild a culture of marriage and family for this nation. Yeah. We have a question from Mandy for Malcolm. Hi, Malcolm. Hi. Notwithstanding your earlier uh, little chat um, <laughs> with your colleague up the end there, um, what comment can you make about the allocation of preferences that One Nation encouraged in the last election, which basically caused us to have a Labor Party yeah, yeah. who brought about the abortion laws and is now looking at euthanasia. Um, I, I take your point that you made that you guys weren't talking, but those were conservative votes that you guys garnered, and I'm guaranteeing you that most of the conservative voters who voted for you weren't anticipating that that would be allocated to a non-conservative party. First of all, Mandy, thank you for the question, and I understand your concern. It's um, something that is very, very important to many people in this audience, I acknowledge that. We always say the voter controls their preferences. That's number one. We also have to put up with comments from the Labor Party saying we preference the Liberal Party and from the Liberal Party who say we preference the Labor Party. Because the reality is that a lot of our supporters come from being former ALP voters and others come from being former Liberal Party voters. So what we did last time, the Labor Party said, you're, you're like, you, you just stink, no one's going to talk to you. And that was Palaszczuk's very, very clever tactic. She did that way up front before the election was called. And what did the Liberal Party do? It scurried away from talking to us because it was afraid to be seen to be doing any deals with us. The Liberal Party would not talk to our senior people who approached them. Would not. That left us with no choice except to say to our voters, you make, the, you make your choice. And that's, that's the, the reality that our voters made the choice. Now, our preferences, according to Anthony Green and other experts, are the most independent of any, of any major party. They're the most, our voters are the most independent. They make up their own minds. And it is up to the damn Liberal Party to come up with policies that make, our, make the voters who vote for us, number one, vote for them, number two. It's not our responsibility. And that's the core in this democracy. So remember that. Voting your preference. Vote number one for the party you prefer, number two for the party you prefer second most, number three, and so on. That is your choice, and the more every election, Pauline and I say that because we're gradually educating voters to say, forget the parties, vote the way you want. That's what democracy is about. My question is to Paul Scar. Over the last 50 years or so, we, our culture and values have shown a tremendous change in community attitudes. And in fact, from my, from my perspective, they've, they've been trashed in, in, in terms of things that were really important. And this has been pushed in large measure by leftist academics and teachers and the public media. When Malcolm Turnbull was communications uh, minister, he was absolutely useless in dealing with the ABC. He made no attempt whatever. Uh, I, uh, 
and uh, the, the SBS has also been engaging in, in social engineering, like it's a program, go back to where you came from. Um, will you, ma will you uh, make a commitment, um, Paul, to push within the, within the LNP and hopefully within a conservative government to set it as an extremely high priority for the government to take back the education system and the public media. Thanks, David. Every single day I'm in the Senate, I will fight for those values I believe in. I was aghast a few weeks ago when school teachers convinced their students that they should go out and march uh, against our government. For goodness sake, during a school day. What's going on? What's going on? But you know what? You know what, ladies and gentlemen? One of the people, one of the people who, who has values which I don't believe in was elected in this state seat, this state seat of Mansfield. And how was she elected? A good friend of mine was the, federal, was the state member in Mansfield, a guy called Ian Walker, a great guy, great guy, I've known him for 30 years, has our values. But One Nation handed out how to vote cards. No, I'm sorry, you need to hear this. This federal election is going to be an important choice and you need to be informed. One Nation handed out a how to vote card to voters. It didn't say allocate your preferences as you decide. No, it didn't. It said vote vote Labor ahead of the... It said... Sorry, Malcolm, let me finish. It said, it said, it said vote Labor ahead of the LNP. So you voted for a radical leftist in the state seat of Mansfield and got rid of a conservative, conservative state member. You tell me how that's made Queensland a better place. Look at the travesty of the Queensland government at the moment. And One Nation bears some of the responsibility for that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Freedom of speech, remember. Next question. Rochelle has a question for Paul. Uh, Paul, I'd like to say that um, I think that's very hypocritical about... You can't tell these days between Labor and Liberal almost. I think they are blending in. You aren't listening. Not, you've not listened. And I think that you're passionate that you are part of a big party, so they don't care what you think. They are going to tell you what you are going to do. They're not going to stand there and allow you to have your opinion. What's the question? Well, that's true. <laughs> now, I also know that the Liberals put One Nation last, last time, and put Labor above One Nation, which is a right-wing um, right side conservative party, so you actually put Labor in power, not one nation. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> could I say to you, the choice of this federal election could not be clearer. Your choice is between a Scott Morrison coalition government, which is going to give you lower taxes, or a Bill Shorten, a Bill Shorten Greens government, a Bill Shorten Greens government which will increase taxes by $387 billion, abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission, and will change this country for the worst. Right? That is your choice. One Nation is not going to form government. No other good people, whatever. They're not going to form government. The choice you have is between Scott Morrison and the Coalition Government or Bill Shorten and the Greens. And if you've been following the political debate, Shorten and the Greens are as left-wing as any party I've seen in the mainstream of political parties, in the mainstream of politics for the last 30 years. That's your choice. It is a clear choice. Thank you, Paul. Very quickly, we have a comment from Debbie. Just from Debbie. Just, just very quickly, I think just look at your candidate. Don't, I don't, don't worry about where they come from. And in the Senate, no, seriously, you've got to look at the values of the people. That's my view of it, right? Also, those kids that went out, they have a freedom of, they have a voice too, and and I, I supported them, and I and I will continue to. We have to listen to our children. You know, they we can't just sit them in the corner and tell them to be quiet. This is their world, their planet, their future. They have a right. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, my name's Chris Green, and I've got a general statement about child support agency and a comment. But let me first say I'm proud to be a hardcore conservative and a card carrying member of the LNP, and I support Paul Scar, Susan McDonald, and Jerry Brennan. Be absolutely clear. And Paul made a good point, it's a clear choice. My issue with child support agency is very simple. Why is it that under the Child Support Agency Act of 1989, if you pay child support and you cannot get access to your children and the government let this go on, it's only a Liberal government in 2007 under Howard that made it better. So why is it that you have paying parents that pay child support for the betterment of their children, but they lose the right to see their children. And I want to commend Lee Derrickson on what they're doing. It's outstanding. So a general question to all of you, whoever wants to answer it, why is this happening? And also, we must keep the filth out. Bill Shorten and the Greens in the story. <laughs> I might not answer this question the way you want to hear it, uh, but where this global financial crisis is a, not just economic, but it's a cultural collapse as well, and, and moral collapse. So the policies to get us out of this economic crisis, I've already stated, but there's certain things we can do right now that were done in the 1930s, and I'm just gonna name them so you know that they're real. Um, modelled upon the prison of the War Precautions Act 1916, after World War I, um, to stop foreclosures of homes and farms until 1920. Um, it was called the Commonwealth Moratorium Regulation because you just couldn't live in your car in those days and people didn't even have them. In part, modelled upon that precedent, every state in Australia enacted legislation during the Great Depression to stop home and farm foreclosures, including Western Australia's Tenants Purchases Act and Mortgages Relief Act 1930, Queensland's Home Purchases Relief Homes Relief Act 1930, Victoria's Unemployed Occupiers and Farmers Relief Act 1931, and the Financial Emergency Act of 1932. And the most effective of them all was Jack Lang's New South Wales Moratorium Act of 19th of December, 1930, which ultimately stopped all foreclosures until 1937. So we have a cultural, moral and economic crisis. We don't need to deal with it by just doing more of the same what we did in a bailout that we all paid for, or a bail-in, uh, which is on the cards right now. We had a bail-in in 1893 in Australia. If you didn't know, we had a housing bubble back then and they stole people's deposits back then. So it's been done in Australia, but they'll do it again. They've already passed laws to do that. So we just can't pick little subjects and go, how are we gonna do with this? How are we gonna do this? We've got to change the economic system, including the voting system should be first past the post. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to stop now. I'm sorry we can't fit in the last two questions. Please ask the person you had that question for. It was a vaccination question. Please ask the person that you wanted to ask that one later. I'm going to hand to Jewel. We are here at the uh, permission of the Malcravat Bowls Club and time is of the essence. So uh, thank you everybody for taking that in the spirit uh, that you did. Freedom of speech, do your research ladies and gentlemen. Vote for the person that matches your beliefs. for coming tonight. You know something I noticed about all of these candidates? Every one of them really cares. And they are all committed to the things that they care about. They're committed to our country. I noticed that. And you know not one single one of them is a career politician. No, not one of them. But John Howard... No, he's not a senator. He's just standing for it. Oh, um, 
John Howard and Bob Hawke both agreed that the career politicians in both their parties, the big parties, had deserted the Australian people and that they were looking after their own interests. This is something that a lot of us have noticed, particularly old people like me. It didn't exist when I was young. And then it became a career choice for people, who, and I'm saying it right out loud, they would sell their mother's soul for their career path. We don't like them. Not one of these people here is anything like that. And that's why you have got character, you've got calibre, you've got competence. So now you've got some names that are going on this massive big Senate paper. Think really carefully about where you put your numbers on that Senate paper. And it's a shame we can't see all of them in the whole state. We'd make really good decisions then. But this is just a toe dip in the water to what democracy should be about. It shouldn't be about just those who get on the six o'clock news.